We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Ephesians chapter 2, we are continuing uh, in our study of the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> this is our third lesson. And we want to continue Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 1. This is a beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, of the Bible, all 66 are beautiful, and uh, but there are some that it's it, you just for maybe a certain time frame you just kind of get lost in them. And I've always been attracted to the book of Ephesians, it is so full of beautiful uh, revelation and understanding. And uh, we want to continue in that today, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. Amen. If you have it, say amen. The scripture says, and you hath he quickened. That means made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Does anybody remember when Jesus resurrected you from your sins? Anybody thankful for the power of the Holy Ghost? He reminds us, wherein in time past you walked according <clears throat> to the course of this world, according to to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling, uh, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But verse number four, he says, but God... Everybody say, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. So thankful that God is rich in mercy, and I'm so thankful that he has great love and that he has resurrected us out of our sins. Amen. I want us to pray today and ask that God would bless our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to understand. His word is anointed, but I want him to anoint me, and I want him to anoint you today and have his way in this house. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you that we are gathered in your presence today in heavenly places in Christ. Jesus, we ask that you would anoint us today to hear the word of the Lord. Speak to our spirits. We give you praise and glory. We lift you up and magnify you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Everyone said amen. Amen. Before you're seated, if you're near someone, shake their hand. Greet them in Jesus' name. Tell them it is so good to be in the house of the Lord. Ephesians chapter number 2 begins with Paul reminding us that we have been, uh, to use the old English word, we have been quickened. That word quickened simply means made alive. It's the same word, of course, we read in Ephesians 4 and 12, <clears throat> where the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful. He is not saying the word of God is fast, although it can be. But he's saying it is alive and it is powerful. And in our text here, he is reminding us that, that we have been made alive. And if you're wondering to what degree we've been made alive, uh, the Bible is, is so, so good at giving us analogies and metaphors to, to illustrate the degree to which a certain thing has occurred. If you're wondering the degree to which we've been made alive, uh, he, this is simply a continuation of what he has been talking about in the first part of, uh, or the last part of the previous chapter. When he begins to discuss the prayers that he has prayed for the Ephesians, he says that I, I cease not to pray for you. And I, 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 he essentially said that I, I'm praying that your eyes would be opened. And that there would be three things, there was three main points, three main bullets on his prayer list that he prayed for the Ephesians. He said, I pray that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And number three, he said that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. 
according to the working of his mighty power. And he begins to talk about that power. He, he says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now, I'm going to tell you today, it's not Easter, but it doesn't have to be Easter to get happy about the fact that Jesus has been risen from the dead. I'm here to tell you I'm glad he died. I'm glad he was buried. But I am so thankful today that we are rejoicing in the fact that Jesus is alive. I don't serve a God that is in a, in a, in a tomb somewhere. But I serve a God that hears and answers my prayers. Aren't you glad we serve a living God today? He's alive forevermore. And, 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 and that is the degree he, that he uses. That is the metaphor that he uses to illustrate how alive we are. Now, I want you to catch that. If you're, wondering, uh, if you're wondering to the degree to which you have been resurrected, you have been resurrected the same way that he was resurrected from the dead. If he has power and he's sitting on the throne and he does have power and he is sitting on the throne, then we have power today in Jesus' name. I think of, and again, the Bible goes out of its way to illustrate, to teach us about uh, things, and it will use examples. One of the, one of the beautiful examples the Bible uh, uh, gives us in regard to uh, what kind of revival we should have and what kind of revival the apostles in the book of Acts should have. And I want to just tell you today, God is inter interested in us having apostolic Holy Ghost revival. God's not interested in just a little bit of revival. He wants us to have a whole lot of revival. Can you say amen? He wants us to have revival until Jesus comes. And you can see this in the way Jesus dealt with the apostles. The Bible says that they were fishermen. And when he called them, they were fishing. And he told them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then he began to give them some fishing lessons. One day they were fishing, and the Bible says they were catching nothing. And so Jesus tells them, he says, uh, and, and in the back of their mind, I'm sure was ringing the, the words, I'm going to make you fishers of men. He said, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. The Bible says they cast their nets on the other side of the boat. And when they did, you know what happened. The Bible says they caught a great catch of fish. It was fish to where the nets were full. It was fish to where the nets were breaking. It was fish so much that literally the boat began to sink. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's a whole lot of fish. I've, I've been fishing before, and I've been with some people that know how to fish, and we've caught some fish uh, uh, because I was with people that knew how to fish. Let me clarify. But I have never been in net-breaking, boat-sinking fish revival. But Jesus said, I'm going to teach you guys something about fishing. That's the kind of revival you need to be expecting. And the Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, I got a feeling these men that were about to be fishers of men, they weren't expecting just a little bit of revival. They weren't expecting to go out and pole cast and catch one or two fish. But the Bible says on the day of Pentecost when Peter started preaching, the Holy Ghost began to move. The power of God began to move. They cast their nets out for men, for souls. And when they pulled them in, it was net breaking, boat sinking revival. I'm going to just stop and tell this church today, you need to raise your expectations if you've got belief that God just wants to give us one or two souls. Come on now, if you're expecting small revival, Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men, and here's what it's going to look like. It's going to be net-breaking, boat-sinking revival. I want revival that's so powerful that it fills this church, but we got to call neighboring churches and say, you got room in your pews? Come on, there's some saints that pray through over in your area, and we send them there. That's the kind of revival Jesus is interested in. Amen. And so he, he uses these uh, metaphors to give us to help us to understand the degree of things. I want to tell you today, when the Bible says we are alive, we're not, just, we're not just here on life support. I'm not, and you're not just barely making it. I'm not looking at people that just got enough faith. Listen, when we, I'm not going to be one of those, and you're not going to be one of those, that when we get to heaven, it's kind of like, whoo, hallelujah, I made it. I don't think there's going to be one person that makes it to heaven that's going to be shocked. But I believe you're going to be there because you want to be there with everything that's in you. 
It's going to be revival and power in your life. When you got the Holy Ghost and were baptized in Jesus' name, it's not the will of God for you to kind of whimper your way through life. But it's the will of God that the same power that filled him. The Bible says in Romans 8, that body was dead, but the Spirit re-entered that body and resurrected him. Paul said in Ephesians 1, he was resurrected. And that's the kind of power I'm praying you got. And then he says, you are alive in Jesus Christ. I've come to tell somebody I'm glad that I've got power, resurrection, Holy Ghost power in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody glad to be alive today? He's quickened us. He said we were dead, but now we're alive. And then he says, I want to remind you what it was like. He said, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Everybody say, according to the course of this world. Everybody say, the prince of the power of the air. And then he says in verse number three, that we had our conversation or our lifestyle in the lust of our flesh. Everybody say, the flesh. So he says that before you were living in the world, the course of this world, the ways of the world, and the prince of the power of the air, he's referring to the devil. He's talking about the power of Satan. And then he says, and then also you were, you were under the bounds and the power. You had your life your lifestyle, your conversation, it was in the lust of the flesh. Paul here <clears throat> is listing in just two verses perhaps the three greatest enemies that we as Christians fight. And this is an important understanding. If you are going to win a battle, you need to know who you're fighting. The Bible says we shouldn't be ignorant of Satan's devices. If you want to win... <clears throat> You got to know who you're fighting. And uh, this is maybe not the best example, but I'm going to tell you, if a, if a boxer is going to meet somebody in the ring, he wants to know what he can know about them. And uh, they will put another boxer in the ring that will imitate the style and uh, to the best of their ability will use the, the jab and the punch and the footwork and the, and the, and the, 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 the strategy of the, the boxer they're about to meet. We, we need to know who we're fighting here today. Now, I want you to understand that we have three main enemies of our soul. Number one, we are at odds with. We are fighting the world. Now, I want to clarify that. That doesn't mean we just, you know, our environment and everybody around us, we're out to, we're just fussing with everything and everybody. But it's talking about the spirit of this world. It's talking about the, <clears throat> the course, the ways of this world. I want to tell you, the ways of this world do not jive with the ways of God. If you hadn't figured that out yet, it's something we need to understand. The Bible says in the book of James, he talks about that they were, you're, you're adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that love in the world is, 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 is basically, it's, it, you don't love God. You have, you have committed adultery with the world. And he said, you can't love the world. And, and the Bible says we are in the world, but we're not of the world. If you hadn't figured it out yet, we are strangers and pilgrims in a strange land. When you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized with Jesus' name, you have joined another nation, another people, another kingdom, another country. You are a part of the kingdom of God. Now, that does not mean that we are anti-America. That does not mean we are anti-the nation we live in. The Bible says, actually, when you become an apostolic, you ought to be the best citizen in your country. Oh, yes. The Bible says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The Bible talks about you should pay your taxes. And the Bible says you should pray for those in leaders and uh, in leadership. We, we ought to be the best. We ought to be the best citizens uh, in, in, in the United States. That's who sh we should be. But I'm here to tell you, while I have allegiance to this country, and I think it's the greatest place in the world to live, and if you don't, then... God bless you. There's other places. <laughs> but if you, but if I, but I, my number one allegiance is not to the United States of America. I'm patriotic. I love this country. But I'm here to tell you my number one allegiance is to another world. My number one allegiance is to God. My number one desire is to please Him. 
Amen. I'm here to tell you, we don't dress like the world. We dress like the kingdom of God. We don't speak like the world. We speak with another language. In fact, we speak in tongues. We don't, we don't walk and talk like others. Our entertainments are not of the world, but our entertainments are, are of another world, of another kingdom. And I'm glad today to rejoice in the fact that I have victory in Jesus' name. I'm in the kingdom of God. And he wants us to know that the world is something we have to contend with. It'll pull at you. It will pull at you. It will try to remove the strands of the tapestry of your Christian walk. It'll try to, it'll try to make you compromise your beliefs. But you got to just live with a good spirit and live for God with all of your heart. So the world is an enemy of our soul. And then he talks about the devil being an enemy of our soul. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter what anybody says. There really is a devil. Did you hear me? There is a devil. And there is a devil that is, that is, uh, that is uh, not, he's not nice. <laughs> he is not nice. He's out to get us. The Bible says that the purpose of the devil is to steal and to kill. This is his job description. Do you imagine you're going to hire somebody and, or, and, um, and on their resume, they put, you know, you ask one question, what are you good at? And they say, well, I'm really good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a great thief, you know. And, and if you ever need somebody bumped, knocked off, I'm a, I'm a good assassin. And if you ever need something destroyed, you got the right guy. Uh, well, that's the devil's job description. That's on his resume. He's come to steal. He's come to kill. And he's come to destroy. And on this Sunday morning, if you're going to make it living for God, we're not living paranoid, but you need to live understanding we have an enemy that's out to get us. The devil's not your friend. Those thoughts he speaks to you are not right. In fact, if his lips are moving, he's lying. The Bible says in John 8 and 44, his language is lying. Like you speak English or Spanish, the devil speaks fluently the language of lying. If he's talking to you, he's out to get you. He's the enemy of your soul. But I'm here to tell you, we've got victory in Jesus' name. The third enemy of our soul is the flesh. The flesh. When I talk about the flesh, I mean literally your, your human nature, your body, you. Did you know that you are one of the greatest enemies you've got? Until you understand that, you're going to be struggling without understanding what's going on. When you read Romans chapter 7, Paul's trying to give us a revelation of, of, the, of the power of the flesh. doesn't matter how long you live for God. Your flesh, you have a fallen nature that is prone to sin. Amen. There is a philosophy in the world today that says that people are basically good. Can I tell you, as nice as that sounds, I wish I could, I could stand on that side. I wish I could promote that thought. But my Bible clearly says that we are fallen. The Bible clearly says that all have sinned and come, and come short of the glory of God. The Bible clearly says that there is none that doeth good. No, not one. It doesn't say it just one time. It says it in Psalms 14. It says it in Psalm 53. It says it in the book of Romans chapter 3 when it quotes Psalms 14 and 53. Can I tell you today, your flesh is one of the greatest enemies of your soul. Paul talks about it in Romans 7. He says, when I want to do good, I do evil. He said, when I want to stop doing bad, he said, I do the bad anyway. He said, I've struggled with this. I work with this. I'm, I'm trying my best to do right, to, but I just can't seem to overcome it. And he gets to the end of the chapter, and it's like he throws up his arms and just screams, Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from the body of this flesh? And some of you have been in that case. I've seen people that have struggled against addictions and struggled against habits. And, and they think there's just something wrong with them individually. Nobody else deals with this. Can I tell you, the whole human race deals with a fallen nature. And when you come to the understanding, I am fallen. My flesh is prone to this. But I don't have to live that way in Jesus' name. Because not, there's not, the flesh is not the only part of you. The Bible says there's also a spiritual side to you. And the Bible says in Galatians chapter number five, it says if we walk in the flesh, we shall live after, or excuse me, it says if we, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And he says the flesh wars against the, uh, the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. If you want to make it in living for God, understand this basic revelation. 
the world we have victory over. In John 16 and 33, Jesus said, I beat that one. He said, I have overcome the world. Anybody glad Jesus has victory over that? And, if, and, and you need to understand when it comes to the devil, in James chapter 4, verse 7, the man of God says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to fear the devil. Now, if you have not yet submitted yourself to God, you need to fear the devil. Amen. I talk to people sometimes, they say that, you know, they've got certain things going on in their world. They want me to come pray for them, anoint their house or whatever the case is. If they don't have the Holy Ghost, I'm going to tell them, you know, you do need, you do need some serious help. But if you have submitted yourself to God and to this apostolic truth, have repented of your sins and have been baptized in Jesus name and have been filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't have to fear the devil. You need to buck up and stand up. You need to look the devil in the eye and say, I resist you in Jesus' name. You've got victory in Jesus. Amen, amen. And so I'm here to tell you those two primary uh, uh, enemies of the soul, the world and the devil, you don't, we've got victory. But can I tell you about your flesh right now? You can rebuke your flesh all day long. I rebuke you, I rebuke you. And your flesh is going to just keep being there. You can, you can pray, and I'm here to tell you, your flesh is going to come back. Until, until the day comes when you breathe your last, you're going to contend with your flesh. You don't rebuke it away. There's not, but I will tell you this, when you have been born again of the water and the spirit, and you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, you have power to live above sin. The way it works is like this. Are you ready? Are you ready? The answer is a daily submitting of yourself to God. The scripture said, Paul speaking, I die daily. You know what that means? Every day you need to pray and say, God, I present my body a living sacrifice. There's not one of you spiritual enough to try to make it two days or a week or a month. I don't understand people that think they can pray one time a month and be okay. You're not going to be okay. You're not going to be okay. But every day you wake up, you need to crawl on the altar and say, God, I present my body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. This is my reasonable service. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm not here to be um, uh, metamorphosed into this world. And I'm here to tell you, you can beat the flesh that way. Did you hear me? I don't care what kind of addiction. I don't, did you hear me? I don't care if you're bound by cigarettes. I don't care, care if you're bound by alcohol. I don't care if you're bound by pornography. I'm here to tell you there is victory in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And it's not going to be just one prayer meeting where you get the victory and you never struggle again. Uh, now, some of that, some of those victories, I don't understand all of this. I do know where God sets you free immediately. But I'm here to tell you, the flesh doesn't roll over and die. Say, they've got the Holy Ghost. But somebody that lives a consecrated life and says, I'm going to beat this, and gets up every day of their life and falls on their knees and said, God, I want victory in Jesus. You can live an overcoming life. He beat the world. You rebuke the devil, and God can give you victory over this flesh in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on now. We need to be full of the Holy Ghost every day of our life. Amen, amen, amen. And Paul said, this is what you used to do and be. He said, you were, before you were quickened, the world, the flesh, and the devil. He said, you fulfilled the desires of the flesh and of the mind. I'm gonna t sometimes it's good for us to stop and remember where God brought us from. You know, there's some real testimonies in this house. Can anybody wave your hand and say, I remember what God did. In Is there anybody that remembers what the world, what your life and your world used to be like. Paul says you need to think about it sometimes. That doesn't mean you live there. Doesn't mean you let your past haunt you. But I will tell you there's a power in your testimony. Paul said the world had you and the devil had you and the flesh had you. And some of you can testify. You remember what your marriage was like before you came to church. You remember what your family was like. You remember what weekends were like. You'd party your brains away. You'd wake up Saturday morning thinking how stupid was I last night? What did I do? Who do I need to call and apologize? Am I, do I need to worry about my job? Do I, how stupid was I? But today, the Bible says in, in verse number four, 
that there's, there's, there's been some things that have happened. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy, I'm here to tell you it's his mercy that has set us free today, and we are alive in Christ Jesus. You know, when you, you talk about people, you know, and, and maybe, maybe you've talked to somebody before, and, or, and they've been bragging on you, talk about what a great guy you are, and and uh, how much they appreciate you and what you've done and the things you've accomplished. And, and, then, and then they pause. You ever experience this? They pause and they say, but uh, <clears throat> there is something I'd like to talk to you about. And, and, and then from there, the, the conversation begins to devolve, shall we say. And, and all the good stuff is instantly forgot. I, and even when we, we talk to people, you know, it's, 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 it's wise if you're a leader or a parent or whoever. When you're correcting somebody to kind of sandwich it between good stuff, you know, you know, you're good, you're doing good, you're doing good, but, you know, and then deal with that and then kind of butter them up there at the end. I heard I, there's one guy, I believe it's Dale Carnegie in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence Your Neighbors. He talks about, don't even use the word, but when you're talking to somebody and you got to correct them. He says, you talk to them and you say, you're wonderful, you're great, you're great, and you could even be better, and then you <laughs> lay it on them. That word, but, it instantly raises your defenses when you're talking about a human being. Every time when you're talking about somebody and you use that, it's in contrast. They're about to, they're about to bring up the, the negativity. But I am here to tell you today, when you talk about God, it's never that way. The Bible says you're rolling through how bad it is, how bad it is, how bad it is, and then it introduces God, and it says, but God who is rich in mercy. I'm here to tell you, we've had some bad days before we ever came to God. But does anybody remember the day that you repented of your sins and God let his mercy work in your life? Amen. I'm thankful for rich mercy. I'm thankful for his mercy. You know, God, and I got to move quick, but God is extravagant in his mercy. He's, he just spreads it everywhere. He, he wastes it on people. I mean, he has wasted mercy on me when I didn't even appreciate it. I, I, I think about the, the, the extravagances of God in, in the world. He, he's extravagant, even in, 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 in nature and in beauty. I've used this example before. You can, there's been times I've been flying in an airplane over uh, places where there's nobody living. Nobody has been there there's no houses. This is out in the middle of the wilderness. I remember one time in particular, it, was, it was, must have been spring. There's these beautiful mountains. On the top there was, was snow, but down where it was getting some sun, out in the middle of nowhere was literally millions and millions of beautiful flowers, wild flowers by the millions that, were, that would grow, that would bloom that would bud, that would, that would open, that would flower. They were absolutely gorgeous, and no human eye would perhaps ever see them. And I was flying in that plane, and I began to cry. And I just thought, you know, God, you are extravagant with your goodness. He's putting beauty out there where nobody will ever see it. He just does it because it's his nature. And I have seen him do that in lives before. I've seen him do it in my life. I'm here to tell you, if you're thinking God's some kind of tightwad with his mercy... If you're thinking you got to somehow twist his arm up in the middle of his back to get him to forgive you, if you're here today thinking that you got to be good enough to get his mercy, I am here to tell you, God is not a tightwad with his mercy. God is not a miser. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. God's not a miser with his mercy, but he is rich in his mercy. He dumps it out when we don't deserve it. He dumps it out when we don't even ask for it sometimes. He, it's available to people that spurn it over and over again. He forgives 70 times 7 in one day. I'm here to tell you, he is rich in mercy. His great love is upon us today. Anybody glad to be in the presence of that kind of a God? Oh, hallelujah. Why don't we lift our hands and thank God for his mercy today? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Paul says, God's rich in mercy. In verse 5, he again goes back to this quickening motif. Even when we were dead in sins. He says that he's done three things for us. He has quickened us. He has made us alive. And then in verse 6, I want you to notice this. Not only has he made us alive, 
and, 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 and notice this too in verse 5, and I hope you're following in your Bibles. But verse number 5, it says he's quickened us together with Christ. Sometimes we miss that little prepositional phrase, with Christ, in Christ, together with him. We've made alive with Christ. I already went through that. To the degree that he was made alive, we are made alive. By grace ye are saved. And then in verse 6, not only has he quickened us with Christ, he's raised us up together with Christ. I used to read that thinking we together as the church have been raised up. But I'm here to tell us today we have been raised up together in Jesus Christ. And then he said, and he's made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to stop and think about that. Think about when Jesus was raised up. Think about how he was lifted up. Think about how he sits now on the throne, is in control, and owns everything. There is something that happens when somebody gets the Holy Ghost and gets baptized in Jesus' name. There is an elevation that begins to happen. Has anybody ever noticed that? There is a lift. There is a raising. God begins to pick people up and bless every aspect of their life. I'm here to tell you, if you're new in church, or if you're, if you're trying to get your, your, get your life situated today, and, and maybe you're worried about certain elements of your life, you need to focus on getting right with God. Don't worry about, come on, if maybe your marriage is busted up, yes, you need to focus on getting your marriage fixed, but number one, you need to focus on getting right with God. If you're here today and your finances are in a disarray, I'm not here to tell you you get saved and God is going to uh, make you a millionaire. But I am here to tell you today that when you get quickened with Jesus Christ, there is a lift that begins to occur. Is there anybody that can testify that God is a quickening? He has done work in our life. I'm looking at some of you today. Some of you, man, it'd be fun if we had the time to pass this micro, microphone around. And I remember... When you came into the church, all the pieces that were in disarray, but somewhere in all of that, God filled you with the Holy Ghost. You were, your sins were washed away, and he put your marriage together. Some of you can testify you have been blessed. Your, your life, even financially, has been, has been blessed because you begin to pay attention to basic principles in the Word of God concerning finances. And there's just an elevation, a redemption lift that picks you up. I'm here to tell somebody we have been raised up together in Christ Jesus. And further, we are sitting in heavenly places today. Now, church... That verse is so easy just to roll past, read through, and ignore. But when you get a revelation where we're sitting today, we are sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's not saying this will happen. He's not referring to, to a, to a post-rapture setting where we're going to be. He is talking about right now when you get the Holy Ghost, you're baptized in Jesus' name. You have been quickened with Christ. You have been made alive from your sins and your trespasses. He's raised us up. And we are sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When you walk into this house on a Sunday morning, when you get with your children and your family, you get those kids dressed, and sometimes, mamas, you get so frustrated trying to get them all ready. And by the time you get to church, you're frazzled. You're just, it takes you 20 minutes to even get your head back on straight. And yes, there is a preacher in the pulpit, and I'm in the house of God. And because it's been such a deal. Get, and you get into the house of God. I'm going to tell you, you need to wake up to the fact of where you're sitting today. We are in a special hallowed house. And God has elevated us. I'm here to tell you, I thank God for his presence today. We have been raised and sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul continues in this, in this text. He said that in the ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And then he says this. This is beautiful. Verse number 8. If you have your Bibles, I want you to pay close attention. He says, for by grace. Everybody say, by grace. Everybody say, by grace. By grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, church... This verse, this verse has been abused by many, but I'm going to tell you, this is in the Word of God, and it is correct. And I'm here to tell us today that it is only by the grace of God that we are sitting in this place. There's not a one of us that's righteous enough. There's not a one of us that's good enough. There's, you can't do enough good things to be saved to be in the house of God. 
I don't care if you mow the church yard. That's not going to save you. I'm all for you going out on outreach, but I'm here to tell you, that's not going to save you. I'm here to tell you, it's essential that you pray and you give and you support the kingdom of God. You need to be in the house of God, but you are not saved by your giving. You're not saved uh, uh, by, by these things. You are saved by the grace of God. You're not saved by how good you are. In fact, I hope to, that God would remind us today of where he brought us from. There's not a one of us here today that is saved because we are good enough. Amen. Sometimes people say, I don't know if I'm good enough to get the Holy Ghost. My pat answer is no, you're not good enough to get the Holy Ghost. There's not a, a single person that is good enough to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus died for our sins. And when you repent of your sins and you are baptized in Jesus' name, he will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost because of his righteousness and what he did on Calvary. Amen. I'm thankful for his grace. Amen. The Bible says we are saved by his grace through faith. Everybody say through faith. So it's his grace, but it's our faith. You understand that? We do have a part to play. There are some people that believe that the, the work of Calvary was, was when, when Jesus died on the cross, that instantly the entirety of the world was saved. They believe it to the point where they believe that Hitler was saved. The blood of Jesus is for everybody, they teach. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not what the Word of God is saying here. The Bible is saying that we are not saved by works. It's by His grace and our faith. When it's talking about works, it's saying that we can't do enough things to be saved. But I do tell you today, and the Word of God tells you, that we play a part in our salvation. Our faith is essential to salvation. Now, a good question to ask is, what does faith look like? Does faith just, is faith just mental assent that says, I believe that Jesus died for my sins? Does faith look like, I believe that he is good and I accept the Lord? I, I, there are some people that say you just, you, there's just essentially, it's only, it's only belief. But my question for them is, uh, most people actually do believe, and I'm talking about den- the denominal world, they do believe that repentance is essential. Now, my question is, is repentance, the act of saying, I'm sorry, Jesus, is that a work? No, that's not a work. That's just faith. If you believe, you're going to repent of your sins. Amen. A good example that I use, very simple, is if I was to, if maybe one of our ushers was to come screaming in the building right now and yelling, the fellowship hall is on fire. What a terrible thing for me to use as an example. But, and, and, and the fellowship hall is on fire where our Sunday school is at. If you parents that are in this building were to say, well, I believe that, and were to nod your head and to say, I, I believe that the fellowship hall is on fire, and you continue to sit here, that is not true faith. Faith would look like some mamas going, ah, and daddy's kicking back their chairs and running through that concrete wall to chase down their kids and make sure they're okay. I'm here to tell you, if you really believe, you're going to act. And if you have faith in God, you're going to repent of your sins. <laughs> Repentance is not a work that we do. You understand that? And furthermore, how about, how about getting the, baptized in Jesus' name? If you believe baptism is a work that you do, what in the world? I mean, then you could go jump in a pool all day long. That's not a work you do. It's not a work that the preacher does. It's a work that Jesus does. It's only by the name of Jesus. When a preacher says, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, that, in that moment, your sins are washed away, not because of you, uh, anything you've done, except that you have, through your faith, entered into his grace that was provided at Calvary. Am I making sense today? Baptism is not a work that you do. It is not equivalent to mowing the churchyard. It is a work. It is a part of faith manifesting himself. And that's why James said, listen, you want to tell me you're saved without, without works? I'm going to tell you, let me show you my faith by my works. Is receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost a work that we do? I am here to tell you, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is a work that he does. 
All you do is repent, get baptized, and say, I want the Holy Ghost. I love you, Jesus. And his spirit will fill you, and you will speak in other tongues. This verse in Ephesians 2 and 8 is exactly right. You're not good enough to be saved. You can't pick up enough trash around the church to be saved. You can't invite enough people uh, to be You can't teach enough Bible studies to be saved. But through your faith and obedience to the word of God, salvation comes. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Anybody glad that he did the work at Calvary? Amen, amen. And I don't have time to do this justice, but that's really what, there's a fancy word in your Bible called justification. That's what that's all about. It just simply means that there's not a one of us that's righteous. There's not a one of us that's good enough. All have sinned, Brother Gary, and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible lets us know that when we repent and are baptized in Jesus' name, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That his righteousness is placed on us. Now think about that. That ought to affect your prayers when you pray. Sometimes we think I'm not good enough to pray. I'm here to tell you when you repent and confess and get your sins right. When you can, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. You are coming cloaked in his righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. That ought to stir somebody that's been living in shame and guilt. I'm here to tell you. If you have obeyed the scriptures and you're living for Jesus, he has cloaked you in his righteousness. Think about it now. You're alive like he's alive. You're lifted with him. And you are sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Anybody thankful you've been saved today? Anybody thankful for Acts 2.38, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost? Amen. I'm so thankful for the work of Calvary in our lives. Paul continues in verse number 9. He says, it is not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, he's talking about these, these works that were, whereby some denominations believe you've got to do these things to be saved. He's not talking about faith. Faith is essential. And faith will manifest itself in repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, obedience to the everlasting gospel. Verse 10, he continues. It's kind of interesting what happens when you continue reading. He then says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Brother Pierce, he immediately says, we're not saved by works, but we should do some good works. When you are saved, we are called to do good. You've heard my dad preach an awesome message that Jesus went about doing good. That's the lost message of Pentecost. Too many times we get saved and we want to sit on a pew. I'm here to tell you, we should be the best neighbors on our block. We should, we should bless our neighbors. We should bless our employers. We should bless our employees. We should bless our coworkers. They ought to be so glad to have us around doing good in Jesus' name. We are called of him to do good works. He continues here, and I'm going to end with this here in just a moment. In fact, I'd like our musicians to go ahead and come. The Bible says that in verse number 11, he says, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, he's talking to the Ephesian church, and he, he, was, he wants to remind them of what Jesus did in joining them, in joining us, as one body in the church. He says, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. He says that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. I'm here to tell you that's exactly who we were before Jesus got a hold of us. He says, you were without hope, you had no, you didn't have God, you were in the world. But verse number 13, and I want you to pay attention now. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. I want to ask, as I teach this lesson today, is there anybody that remembers how far away you were before Jesus got a hold of you? Is there any, have we lived for God so long that we can't remember 
what the blood of Jesus did in our lives. Is there anybody that remembers the day you repented of your sins, were baptized in the name of Jesus, you, you received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the blood of Jesus worked in your life? He then says in verse 14, this is a beautiful scripture here. Listen to this. He says of Christ Jesus, He is our peace. Everyone say, He is our peace. He is our peace who hath made both one, both Jew and Gentile, circumcision and uncircumcision, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You know, we live in a, in a divided world. You want to get in trouble? You talk politics at work. You're going to get in trouble real quick. Just, just keep your mouth shut and talk about work. <laughs> because there's so many divisions politically. Our world is divided socially. Our world is divided economically. Our world is divided by ideologies and, and different things. It's like everybody hates everybody. It's, it's like there's just all these pockets of people that live in the same country and nobody likes anybody. There's walls between us. I'm here to tell you, that's one of the main purposes of the devil is to set up walls between people. He wants to set up walls in churches. He wants to, there to be division in the church. I'm thankful for a house of God where there is unity in Jesus Christ. Can I tell some married couple, couples, you want to know where those divisions are coming uh, from, uh, between you? Some of that may just be life, but I'm here to tell you, there's a devil that wants to put a wall between your marriage. You want to know where the divisions come between you and your children? I'm here to tell you, it's because of sin and Satan. He wants to set up walls between parents and children. He wants to do it between families and, and every, every group in the world. He wants to set up walls. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ has an entirely different purpose today. My Bible says he is our peace. Anybody glad for peace in Jesus? Peace that passes understanding. He is our peace. Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. When you look around at the church, I'm here to tell you, there's no room for walls in this place. There's no room for walls politically. There's no room for walls via ethnicity or color or economic or class or or I'm here to tell you, we're just of one kingdom. You want to know what our belief system is? It's Jesus' name. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. We're in this world. We're not of this world. There's only one people. That's why in Galatians 3 and 28, it says there is neither Jew nor Greek. It says there is neither uh, Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. There's no bond nor free, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. It's not saying there's not distinctions between the genders, between the sexes. It's not saying that. But when you come to church, there's just one church and one body in Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell somebody today. I'm just teaching this lesson. We're about to move into the second part of this lesson. And God's going to do some incredible things. But you've been living in a walled up world. Some of you that you feel so alone and isolated. I'm telling you today, one of the primary purposes of this service is God has come. And he's come with a bulldozer to knock some walls down today. Is there anybody that wants God to work in your heart and life he can take away hate. He can take away prejudice. He can take away anger. He can take away wrath. He can take away immorality. He can take away deceit. I'm here to tell you there is power in Jesus' name. He is our peace. He has made both one. Why don't we stand today? Why don't we lift our hands? Why don't we thank God for the power of what he has done? Come on, lift your voice to him right now. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, let him hear you today. I worship you.